Another thing that I say, mentioned in my introduction was the fact that you've made two international reputations, the other one, besides linguistics, being as a political activist. And it does seem to me that there is a connection uh, between these two uh, careers of yours. And I want to put this to you, really, in the form of a question. Liberalism grew up in the history of European thought in very close relationship to empirical philosophy and scientific method. The battle cry, really, in all three was, don't accept anything on the say-so of established authority. Look at the facts and judge for yourself. And this was revolutionary in politics, science, and philosophy. And because of this, uh, liberalism has always been regarded in the Western tradition as the main anti-authoritarian political creed. But he, just as you've rejected empiricism, You've also rejected liberalism, and you now say in your writings that whatever may have been true in the past, liberalism has now become the ally of authority. Uh, do, would you accept that there is this underlying connection between your work in linguistics and, uh, well, to put it dramatically, your opposition to the Vietnam War? Well, this raises quite a welter of questions. Let me begin by saying something about liberalism, which is a very complicated concept, I think. It's correct surely, that liberalism grew up in the intellectual environment of empiricism and the rejection of authority and trust in the evidence of the senses and so on. However, liberalism has undergone a very complex evolution as a social philosophy over the years. If we go back to the classics, or at least what I regard as the classics, say, for example, Humboldt's Limits of State Action, which inspired Mill and is a true libertarian, liberal classic, if you like, the, the world that Humboldt was considering which was partially an imaginary world, but the world for which he was developing this political philosophy was a post-feudal but pre-capitalist world. That it was, a, it was a world in which there is no great divergence among individuals in the kind of power that they have and what they command, let's say. Uh, but there was a tremendous disparity between individuals on the one hand and the state on the other. Consequently, it was the task of a liberalism that was concerned with human rights and equality of individuals and so on. It was the task of that liberalism to dissolve the enormous power of the state, which was such a, an authoritarian threat to individual liberties. And from that, you develop a classical liberal theory in, say, Humboldt's or Mill's sense. Well, of course, that is pre-capitalist. He couldn't conceive of an era in which a corporation would be regarded as an individual, let's say or in which such enormous in which enormous disparities in control over resources and production uh, would distinguish between individuals in a massive fashion. Now in that kind of a society to take the Humboldtian view is a very superficial liberalism because while opposition to state power in an era of such divergence conforms to Humboldt's conclusions, it doesn't do so for his reasons. That is his reasons lead to very different conclusions in that case. Namely, I think his reasons lead to the conclusion that we must dissolve the authoritarian control over production and resources, which leads to such divergences among individuals. In fact, I think one might draw a direct line between classical liberalism and a kind of libertarian socialism, which I think can be regarded as, the, as a kind of an adapting of the basic reasoning of classical liberalism to a very different social era. Now, if we come to the modern period, here, liberalism has taken on a very strange sense, if you think of its history. Now, now, liberalism is essentially the theory of state capitalism, of state intervention in a capitalist economy. Well, that has very little relation to classical liberalism. In fact, classical liberalism is what's now called conservatism, I suppose. But this new view, I think, really is, a, in my, my, my view at least, a highly authoritarian position. That is, it's one which accepts a number of centers of authority and control, the state on the one hand, uh, uh, agglomerations of private power, on the other hand, all interacting with individuals as malleable cogs in this highly constrained machine, which may be called democratic, but uh, given the, uh, the, the actual distribution of power is very far from being meaningfully democratic and cannot be so. So my own feeling has always been that to achieve the classical liberal ideals for the reasons that led to them being put forth in a society so different, we must be led in a very different direction. Uh, it's superficial and erroneous to accept the conclusions which were reached for a different society and not to consider the reasoning that led to those conclusions. 
the reasoning, I think, is very substantial. I, I'm a classical liberal yeah. in this sense, but I think it leads me to be a kind of an anarchist, yeah. you know, a, uh, an anarchist socialist. And well, I'd love to pursue you down that road, mm -hmm. Professor Chomsky, but that would be a new discussion and a new program. So I think we must, alas, end there. Thank you very much.